until now. Yeah? We talked about all the things companies do as part of HRM. Yeah? We talked about employer branding, we talked about selection, we talked about compensation benefit, change management, retention, employee survey, all this stuff. All the circles in this picture represent the things you do in human resource management. So, and now, at this point, we have finished this part. Yeah? And in the remaining part of our lecture, I would like to talk about um, more infrastructural things. Yeah? Um, who is doing all this? Yeah? We talk about the HR organization. How can we use IT to support all this? Information technology. How can we use social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, for all these things? And how can we measure the success of all these things as part of HR controlling? So that's a different level. This is more about, yeah, let's say, the infrastructure. And uh, <clears throat> today I would like to talk about HR organization. I mean, some of you might have the rather naive idea that, okay, I mean, there is a pers personal department. Yeah? Okay. There's a company, and there is the, the plant, the factory, and there is the Verwaltungsgebäude, where all the administrative stuff takes place. And here on the second floor, in three rooms, there is the HR department. That's the HR organization, full stop. Yeah. Yes, for some small companies, that's still true. You have probably some nice ladies uh, in the HR department doing all this selection mm -hmm. stuff, compensation, benefit, payroll, blah, blah, blah. But for bigger companies, that does not apply. I mean, you think about companies like BMW, Shell, Microsoft, Google, SAP, PricewaterhouseCoopers. It looks totally different. I mean, that topic is also relevant, especially for those of you who have the idea to work in HR. I mean, HR is a, it's a, it's an exciting field. I really can recommend to work there. But it really depends on where you will work. Uh, so, I will show you how HR departments are organized, what are the different roles, what do they do, and then you will see that there are totally different places inside an HR organization where you do totally different things. Yeah. Okay, so um, some leading questions here are, first of all, what are central, what are local responsibility in international HR organizations? Yeah. Primarily, when you talk about these companies which I just have mentioned, they are all global players. And how does an HR organization look like in those kind of companies? And we talk about how responsibilities in the HR department change I mean, really, we have these old days. The old days where maybe a naive understanding comes from. And we have the future. HR now and in the future is totally different with regards to its responsibilities compared to HR 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago. Yeah? I will show you how things change in, 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 and where things uh, go to. And then we eventually will talk about the roles and the areas inside a modern HR organization. Okay, so at the end of this chapter, you really have an understanding how HR works from an organizational standpoint. And I'd like to start with uh, some international aspects, okay? So how does it look like? Uh, very simple. All companies, 
<laughs> all big companies have a headquarter somewhere. Where is the headquarter of Adidas? Herzogen Aurach. Where the hell is Herzogen Aurach? Huh? Somewhere in Bavaria. In Franken. Yeah? Why is it there? Huh? Why is it there? Because the guy who founded it, he was from Herzogen Aurach. Yes. Mr. Dassler. Adi Dassler. He lived there and he started producing shoes together with his brother Rudolf Dassler. <laughs> this, these brothers got into conflict because why? Because of a woman. <laughs> okay, so they got their separate ways. And Rudolf Dassler ran, started running his own business, Puma. Both came from Herzog and Aura. That's the reason why they are in Herzog and Aura. Yeah. Why is SAP in Waldorf? I mean Waldorf. Sorry. I mean, they came from this region, the founders, and they wanted to, they wanted to um, build their facilities in Mannheim. Where they came from. But the city of Mannheim, they said, oh no, we don't need this company here. <laughs> it was a big mistake. So they said, okay, let's find another place. Okay, let's go to Waldorf. There are historical reasons why companies are headquartered where they are, where, where they are headquartered. Yeah. So the headquarters growing. Uh, and then they start building subsidiaries in different regions. Yeah, so in global companies, you typically have the headquarter that take care for all the global things, and then you have some regions. And you will hear terms like EMEA, Europe, Middle East, Africa. For some, for some corporations, Africa belongs to Europe. <laughs> it's, it's this, okay. And then you have another region, the Americas, it's this the. And then you have some companies named Asia Pacific, where Australia also belongs to typically. So, so companies are divided into large regions in the world. And within the regions, you have subsidiaries, Niederlassung. Yeah? And the head of these subsidiaries, they, they typically report to the head in the regional headquarter, and he or she reports to somebody in the headquarter. This is how large-scale corporations look like. Very simple. I mean, you knew this. The point is, we have HR people in the headquarter, we have HR people in the subsidiary. We have HR people, recruiters, trainers, developer, all this kind of stuff which you typically find in HR organizations. You have these in the regional headquarter. Yeah? So HR is everywhere. Now the question is, I mean, who does what? If you do an internship in HR, it's a total difference whether you work in HR, let's say, in Suju, somewhere near Shanghai, or in Barcelona, or whether you work at Bosch in the headquarter, which is where? Schwiebeling. Sorry? Schwiebeling. Stuttgart? Schwiebeling. Schwiebeling. Okay. <laughs> Schiller here is its name, yeah? Schwiebeling? Yeah. It's near Stuttgart, yeah. You drive through the wood, and there is nothing. Wood, 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 and suddenly there is a hospital. No, it's not a hospital, it's the headquarter. <laughs> there are HR people. If you do an internship in HR on the Schillerhöhe, in the headquarters, you will do totally different things than if you do your HR internship in Barcelona. Let's talk about this. The first thing I want you to understand is how these kind of 
internalization, uh, internationalization, globalization takes place. What are the different phases? I mean, you, you, you know this term, international, multinational, international, and for some of you this might be all the same, more or less. Global company, international company, multinational, it's all the same. No, it's not. It's not. Um, there's a great book which I really can recommend, written by Bartlett and Goshal, Managing Across Borders. It's a Bible about international management. And they, they show that there are different types of how companies can operate on an international level. Let's have a more historical view. Let's take a company uh, like, you know, SICK, S-E-C-K, yeah. the people out of this region, they know this company. It's a very successful company in Waldkirch. Waldkirch is near Freiburg. Why is SICK there? Because the founder, Mr. Sick grew up there. I don't know whether he grew up there, but he lived there. They, uh, they produce products in the uh, automation, uh, uh, what do they call it? automation technology. Um, whenever it comes to sensorical technique, optic techniques uh, in the automation process, then they come into play. Very innovative. So, Companies like this, they start their business where the founder lives, in the garage. <laughs> they start doing things, small company, and then the company grows. At this phase, the company is purely national, regional. Yeah? But the more the company grows, the more it succeeds, the, the higher is the probability that sooner or later, one customer is from abroad, Switzerland, <laughs> Austria. Yeah. Once you have one single tiny customer in Switzerland as a German company, are you international then? Yes, of course, you're international. You you do business across borders. That's international. <laughs> yes, and <clears throat> the first thing is that you, 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 you have expatriates, for instance. You, you assign people from the home country to the foreign, it's still the foreign country, yeah, uh, who transfer knowledge there, who do sales there. Yeah. So uh, once you have maybe subsidiaries also abroad in the so-called foreign country, yeah, you are really international, but you are very headquarter-minded. That's, that's always the case. As a company like SIG, they, they are Waldkirch-focused. You know? I think Waldkirch is the center of the world. And from here, we operate into the foreign countries, okay? International, that's the very first step. <clears throat> then, what happens next? The company is growing and growing, and they have subsidiaries, not only in Switzerland, in Austria, but now they have a subsidiary uh, in Czech Republic, they have a subsidiary in, uh, in China, in Brazil, yeah? And things are growing, yeah? <clears throat> Doesn't matter whether in the subsidiaries there only only sales takes place or production or whatever. You start building organizations in the still so-called foreign country, and the bigger the, comp the subsidiary is growing, the, the bigger it gets. The more HR people you will find there. Yeah? If you have 100 people in a subsidiary, you probably have one or two people to take, take care about HR stuff. Yeah? Once you have 500 people, you might have five, six, seven people. You suddenly have an HR director there. Yeah? Uh, the typical thing which is happening is that 
These HR organizations in Brazil, in China, they, they work very autonomously. They do their own things, their own way of recruiting. They probably have their own payroll. They, they have their own training development. Um, they have their own performance management. This is something which you always find in most companies, that they start that way. Still, the term foreign country, Ausland, exists in the mind of the people. There's the headquarter, the center of the world, and then we have the subsidiaries out there. Yeah? If you do meetings, global meetings, the managers come to the headquarter yeah? because that's the center of the world and they speak German. Yeah? They try to speak German. Still very home country minded. Okay? What happens then is that sooner or later the company will realize that we must change something. Yeah? It can't be that the way how we compensate our managers is different from country to country. It can't be that every company is creating their own styles uh, with regards to the job ads. Yeah? Have you ever th seen a job ad of Audi in China in earlier days? It's, in my eyes, it's ugly, yeah? But they love it. It's not Audi, it's not this gray style, it's very colored, fancy. And for a company like Audi, it's not acceptable that in every country they do their own things, yeah? So they try to consolidate things. How can you, question to you, <clears throat> how can you tell whether recruiting in a company, Microsoft, BMW, SAP, how can you tell by a look on the website whether the, com whether the company is running a multinational recruiting organization or a global recruiting organization? How can you tell it by the website? Simple. Maybe in which languages the website is designed? Right. Yeah, it's a German company, it's all in German. <coughs> yeah? While while there are some local pages which are then in French, yeah? Okay. Spanish, English. Yeah. There is more than this. If you have different uh, website layouts for different countries? Different website li li website layouts, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what happens if you, you you want to find a job as a controller? Let's take this example. And you don't care about where you will work. <laughs> you are flexible. How will the so job search look like in a global organization versus in a multinational organization? With the global, you have one search... Uh window for all the countries That's where you can just say all countries and controller and whatever and for a multinational you have to visit like 25 pages right. 25 <laughs> national divisions. That's right. So in a global organization you have one single website with one single database. You type in controller the field where you have to type in country, you just leave it empty and you get all the jobs, all the controller jobs worldwide by one single click. That's possible because there is one database behind it. Yeah? If it's a multinational organization, the first decision which you have to make is, okay, do you want to work in Asia? Do you want to work in UK? Do you want to work in Spain? Do you want to work in the States? And from there, you have to start your search. And it looks different. Okay? So that's a very simple indication of whether the recruiting organization is multinational or global. Global means 
the entire world is seen as one, one market. In the minds of the people, in the minds of the employees, the term foreign country doesn't exist anymore. At SAP, we never use the term Ausland. I mean, what's Ausland? Ausland depends on where you are. Yeah? There is no foreign country, there is no Ausland in a global organization. And global not only means um, doing things the same all across the world, it's also something that relates to the mindset of the people. Do we think really in global terms? Right. So, multinational means you have a local differentiation. That's an important term here. Local differentiation means every country does what it's best for the country. Yeah? In Brazil you think, okay, we in Brazil, we know the market better than the people in the headquarter at Schillerhöhe. So, we do the things in a way how we like to do it. We are closer to the people. We are closer to the labor market. We better know the local culture. So everything we do fits to the local condition to the best possible degree. When you act like this in every country, then you, you, you really achieve something which we name local differentiation. Things are different from country to country because they must be different because the countries are different. Yeah? From a global perspective, you think differently. You think, okay, we are one country, we are one company. We act in one global market. We, we, we want to achieve what we name global integration. We want to achieve synergies. Yeah? We also want to present ourselves as one single company. Yeah? We are not so fragmented. We are one single company. So here is the conflict between local differentiation, which makes sense, yeah? and global integration. So, question. Employer branding. Positioning and presenting a company as a strong employer, employer branding. Is that something that your company should do on a global basis or on a local basis, please? Well, I think you can uh, position yourself as a, a strong employer globally, but it will mean a di something different for every country. So that's how many companies like to say employer branding. The way how we appear in the market, on the job ads, on the career website, must have one, one message, one look and feel, yeah? globally. We don't want that the ads in Shanghai look totally different than the ads in Italy. We want to have one, one appearance, one look and feel. While the countries have their local flexibility, maybe using different pictures, uh, different texts maybe to a certain extent. Yeah? So employer branding typically is something that you do globally. Many companies nowadays learn this and, and follow this approach. How is it about um, candidate selection? for production, yeah? a production worker. Should, should the employee for production be selected by the headquarter or by HR, which operates in this particular plant? So production worker for Bosch in Barcelona, oh, Barcelona, uh, Barcelona. Should it be selected by HR staff in Barcelona or somebody in Bavaria, uh, in Schillerhöhe? Local. Local. Executive compensation. 
the way you compensate define the salary of top executives should this be done locally or by the headquarter headquarter so <clears throat> you already see that some things can be done globally some other things can be locally and this leads to an approach which is named the transnational approach it's not whether you do everything global or everything local. It's the question of what should we do globally, what should we do locally? Okay, where does the need, the need for local differentiation, where is the need for local differentiation, differentiation high? Where is the need for global integration high? And then you find very different things that you can do as part of HR. Training the people. That's very often something which can be done very <laughs> locally because you have to train the people different from country to country. That, by the way, does not apply for training executive. That is something you would do globally. Yeah? Employer branding. So you have a high need for global integration. Career website is somewhere in between. So you, you sort all the activities in HR according to the need for local differentiation or for global integration. So in this picture, local differentiation, global integration is not seen as, uh, as contradiction. It's seen as something, okay, uh, how can we combine these different things? So transnational organization means to find a smart way to allocate different tasks in HR to the local organization or to the global organization. Do you know anybody, friend, peers, relatives who work in HR? Have you ever worked in HR maybe? If you think of somebody working in HR, what do you think they, they do the entire day? I mean, we could do this exercise, take a piece of paper and write down five things people in HR typically do. What is on your paper? Um, you probably will find some things which are kind of administrative. It relates to administration. <laughs> Preparing a work contract. Yeah. Uh, writing a job ad and post it on Monster. Pre-select um, incoming applications. Organizing an interview. Um, these are all administrative things. Do HR people do this? Yes, of course. <laughs> it's daily work. Yeah? Much paper stuff. Or using a system. Some of you might say, no, I mean, it's not only administration. I mean, there are people who knock at your door at HR. Okay. Well, Mr. HR, I, 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 I need to improve my 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 competence is in using Microsoft Office. Do we do you offer any courses on this? Yeah? Is there any training? Do you have any recommendation? Somebody's knocking at your door saying, Hey, I'm now seven years with this company. I'm a middle manager. Do I get a company car? Yes? Ah. Oh. Is it an A4, A5, A6, A8? Yes. This is... Or a manager knocks at your door saying, I have an employee. He's a trunk. What to do? He comes late every morning. Trunken. What to do? This is not administration. This is support. You help people. Uh, mainly individuals, managers, employees, or 
certain areas. Uh, some of you might say, no, it's not only administration, it's not only support. I have a friend who is about building an employer brand. Yeah? He's running a big project. I know somebody in HR, she is managing a global employee survey. And that's huge. I know somebody who is building an, H, uh, an executive development program. This is not administration. This is not support. This is consulting. Yeah. This is complex work, high value, complicated, <coughs> yeah. sometimes huge, difficult. Maybe you have a father or mother or uncle or so who is an HR director. <laughs> and learn from him or her that, no, he's not doing projects. He's not supporting people. <laughs> he's, he's not doing the administrative stuff. He's sitting at the table of the executive board. And he's thinking about the future strategy of the company. And he always looks at the current possible strategies of the company uh, from an HR perspective. Should, you, should we really change the strategy and, and entering the Asian market while we see that labor markets are rather difficult and our people lack the competencies doing so? So this is, this is strategy. Okay, so whenever you think of different activities HR typically does, you can always um, uh, put these activities in one of these four boxes, either administration, support, consulting, strategy. Now, the point is when you look at very traditional HR, if you look at, a, let's say, a conservative HR mid-sized company in the middle of Black Forest, you will find that the people in HR primarily do administrative stuff. Hire somebody. Fire this man. But Lord, don't let him bleed too long. <laughs> don't make too much noise. Can you do this? Yeah. Oh, we have to change the company car policy, which is always very hard to <laughs> Um administration, pure administration. Be careful. If you work in HR, in a mid-sized small company, you probably will do a lot of admin. It's not the case for all companies. I know companies which are very modern, very, very straight ahead, but typically you find much administration, uh, administration some support, a little bit consulting and then a tiny piece of strategy. And in the last few years, or I can say decades, many HR people, HR directors, HR executives said, no, we have to change this. Uh, we have to change our role, our responsibilities in a way that, yes, we do some administration, but that's the minor part. Yeah, we only take care for the difficult stuff. We do a lot of support to the people. We do a lot of consulting work and much more strategy. Okay, so you have found this slide in almost every presentation ten years ago. Yeah, when companies started to think about how should we change our role, we must readjust our responsibilities from being a primarily administrative organization to organization which does more high value work. Yeah? That was really the vision. And today you find a lot of companies which uh, went some steps further and really have changed their responsibilities. Yeah? We are in the middle of it. Um, related to this, I would like to, to show you an approach which I really like. It's from 
my old boss, like my former boss, yeah? my former boss, Leslie Heyman, he was the HR executive at SAP for a while. And uh, he always proposed that there are the four P's of HR. So don't, mix, don't mix it up with the four P's in marketing, <laughs> which aren't valid anymore, anyhow. The four P's, that's something different. Les always says that there are four different levels of HR. And that really makes sense. I mean, uh, he says, if you look at companies, you probably will find that the HR department is the department where you will find the politest, nicest people in the company. They are nice. <laughs> okay? Taking care of all, all your stuff, yeah. Uh, oh, we need a we need a change in the working contract. Yes, I will do this. Thank you. Sir. Yes, I will fire this man. <laughs> nice people. There are people saying, I love to work in HR because I love to work with people. Yeah. That's crabby. You don't work in HR because you love to work with people. You will work with people in any other department in the same way. Yeah. Then you find a lot of companies where HR took over the role of, let's say, a policeman, um, taking care that all the regulations, the policies, the processes, are really applied in the right way. Yeah? Mr. Manager, have you done your performance appraisal with your team? Yeah? No? You must do this. Huh? Send me the form. Latest by end of April. Oh, you have hired people? Didn't you use our recruiting standards, which we have developed in HR? Yeah? Didn't we told you, Mr. Manager, that we in HR, we, we have defined the way how we do things in that way and we did it differently? Bad manager. <laughs> Police. Ensuring that things are done in the right, in brackets, in the way how HR defined it, way. From there, yeah, you find some companies saying, more and more companies saying, no, we don't want to be the polite people, we don't want to be uh, the policeman inside the company, we want to be partner to the business. What does that mean, partner? Partnering means that you interact on the same eye level. Yeah. Okay. And there is a manager in a division, let's say, and there is the Partner. We, today we name it and we talk about the HR business partner. That's a role. And time to time you sit together thinking about the future challenges of that particular division. And as HR business partner, you always think about okay, what does that mean for HR? Okay. So, and we define certain activities, measures, which at the end, and that's the important thing, which at the end support the business. HR as a partner is there to support the business. Okay? It's not administration. It's not about taking care that things are done in the right way. It's, it's I support you with all HR-related, people-related challenges in order to achieve business success. Let's always say, no, HR must be more than this. They must be a player. Yeah? And this is something which we hardly find. An HR executive who makes a decision about future product strategies. 
Have you seen this? Can you imagine this? An HR executive who is heavily involved, just like the CFO or any, 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 anyone else, in all strategy-related decisions. An HR executive who thinks about the future, not of HR, but of the future of the company, the future of the business as such. In Germany, I know maybe five HR directors which act on this level. Yeah? Most of them are somewhere here. Yeah? Some more move into a partner. Okay. I like this. That, that shows a little bit this, this, uh, this entire uh, spectrum of, of possibilities. I, I can also recommend uh, Les Heyman's blog can read more about this. Now, what does that mean? One of the first thinkers in that field was a man, his name is Dave Ulrich. You should have heard this name. It's like, I mean, there, there is no lecture about strategy without thinking about Michael Porter. So the Michael Porter of HR is probably Dave Ulrich. He's fantastic, really. I, I, I met him a couple of times. He's the god of HR. Uh, very lovely person. Um, very funny. Very, truly inspiring. Yeah. Spending a workshop with him a day, it's afterwards I it changed 20 of my slides in my lecture. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, what made him so so well known was a book he has written in the late 90s uh, Human Resource Champions if you work in HR you must read this book yeah. and uh, he defined a role model which is the HR the, the Dave Ulrich HR role model um, <coughs> and what does he say he says in HR, as HR department, we must be strong in both in strategic things and in administrative things. It's not that we need to move from administration to more strategic things. It's, it's the question of how do we do both things right? If payroll, which is typically a very operational thing, if payroll does not work well, if people don't get the correct salary, you will never be in a position to talk about strategy. You first, as HR, have to do your administrative homework, so to speak. You have to be strong in this. You have to be a professional in this. And you must be strong in strategy. I mean, think about the, all this accounting, finance stuff. It's the same. You have to be, you have to think in strategic terms, then it's more controlling. If you think in more, what do we do with this invoice, it's probably more accounting, at least from my naive understanding. You know it better. Right? It's just a dumb psychologist thing. So, he says, coming from there, there are four different roles. As I said, strategic partner, yeah? you act with the executive board. You think about the future of the business. You look at business challenges from an HR perspective. Say, okay, we need people for supporting this strategy we have a talent shortage, so we have to invest in employer brand. We have to position ourselves better. Let's do this. Let's focus our resources on positioning the company as a strong employer. Okay, the future of our company will be this and this in five, ten years, so we have to grow some executives. So we have to enhance 
our executive development program in, in specific ways. We have to make sure that certain capabilities, certain competencies are there with our managers so that we succeed with a given strategy. That's strategic thinking in HR. We have to focus on certain key roles, key functions. Yeah? Then companies always go through changes as we have spoken, as, as I've shown you. And as HR, HR must act as a change agent. Here in a different sense than I've shown you earlier. Change agent here means that HR is heavily involved in shaping new organizations, helping companies to succeed in any kind of change. That's, that's about change management. Then, of course, administrative expert. You have to be a professional in preparing working contracts. You have to be professional in running payroll. Uh, you have to be a professional in all these kinds of things. No doubt about it. Okay? And uh, then you have to be an employee champion. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, that's about the commitment and capability of the people. Shaping an environment, shaping processes, shaping all the things which are relevant for the people, that they love what they do and that they are strong in what they do. It's about motivation, performance. Right? Um, okay? So, there should be no HR lecture. <laughs> without having seen this model. Yeah. And you should be able to explain these building blocks. Yeah? You find a lot of sources about this even in the internet. Okay? And that's the, 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 the crown, the basis for a lot of things which we now find in HR. Okay? So, um, a new role, based on this, a new role in HR emerged in the last few years. A role which you have never heard of 10, 15 years ago. It's the role of the HR business partner. It's the idea of there is an HR person dealing with the head of a division, let's say, of a country, of a large organizational unit, dealing with all people-related things. In earlier days, you had terms like HR generalist, personalreferent. Yeah? But these terms are dying. Yeah? You still find these terms, HR generalist, the HR person that takes care for everything <laughs> and knows everything. Personalreferent. Yeah? The one who takes care for all the HR stuff. Today we name it HR business partner and I mean there is no better way of showing you the responsibility of a typical HR business partner uh, and sharing um, job ad with you. This is, I just, really, I just went to monster.com. Monster.com is job board. And I typed in HR business partner. You'll find a lot of positions. Yeah, and I just took, I don't even know this company. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Ah, okay. <laughs> so I'm a professor in training. I don't know. That. <laughs> okay. Are they good? Good brand? Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, fine. <laughs> So, uh, what's written here is exactly what you find on the right side. It's amazing how much text you can put into <laughs> <laughs> Provide HR consultation, policy, interpretation, and strategic planning to all levels of client organization. Wow. Huh. Managing HR projects and program implementation employer branding, employee surveys, executive development, 
for public policy, law and security and strategy development and planning organizations. Responsible for providing human resources support. It's the support level in the areas of ethics, compliance, equal employment opportunities, equal employment opportunities, compensation planning, performance management, talent management, headcount management, leadership development, staffing, absence management, employer relations, labor relations. <laughs> Ability to influence without direct authority, yeah? leading through competence, charism, empathy, diplomacy. Provide analysis of data and monitor HR results through key metrics, develop and communicate status of key initiatives with HR report. That's huge. Yeah? Yeah, it's showing you this because this is not an HR administration guy. Uh, this is much more than this. Uh, it takes some years of experience to fill up this role successfully. Okay? Now there is the admi administrative part. Yeah? Verwaltung. Also there, a lot of things changed. Yeah? And uh, nowadays, if you look at, at the administrative part in large, scales, large scale organizations such as Microsoft, ABB, SAP, BMW, Shell, all these companies, then how does this work? Imagine you have a question. You're an employee in one of these companies and you have a question. Do I get a company card? If yes, when? Which one? You have a question. You have a question about your payslip. You don't understand something. You want to do a training on, let's say, time management, project management. So you have a question. And you think, okay, there is an HR department where I can address this question. Right? And I mean, you, your understanding probably is that, okay, there is an HR department somewhere... Or here in this uh, building, uh, second floor, I go to this nice lady and say, Hey, Mrs. Pista, uh, I want to do a training. Can you help me? And that is not the way how it works in big corporations. In big corporations, it works like this. Um, the first step you have to undertake as an employee, whenever you have a question, is that you enter the intranet. <laughs> okay. You have a portal, employee portal. In the intranet, there might be a Q&A, question and answers. Um, you're looking for, okay, company car, and then you get something. It's easy. Yeah? Um, or there is something like a virtual assistant. Do you know what that is, a virtual assistant? I could show you, but because I'm uh, running out of time. A bit. Uh, go to ikea.com, okay? Ikea.de or... Yeah? And you will find Anna. Have you seen her? Anna? Yeah? Anna? It's, it's a, little, a little, little window. And there you can ask questions. Do you have chairs? Yes, here's the link. Uh -huh. How much is a bid? Oh, different. If you want to learn more about our bids, click here. Did that help? Yeah? So it's, it's a, virtual, a virtual assistant. It's, 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 uh, it's not a real person behind. It's an automated assistant uh, with a huge database uh, of uh, possible questions and right answers. Okay. Oh, you have something like an internal yellow page. Oh, I need an expert on something, uh, on labor law. Huh? Where do I find information about working contracts or, I don't know, about our salary schemes? So. Uh, you find a yellow page and you find some experts which you can contact. So, the idea is that in the first step, um, you, you are enabled to answer your question by your own. Okay? And there is one thing else, one thing more. ESS, you know what that is? 
employee self-service. Employee self-service. What is a self-service? Um, when you do a transaction, if you want to transfer money from your account to another account, um, you do it by your own. Okay. You enter a portal, or you have an app, and you do it. In earlier days, you entered the bank, you had to fill in a form, and you hand it over. Yeah. There was an employee involved. Today, there is no employee involved on the side of the bank. You do it by your own. Yeah? It's a self-service. If you want to get approval for, for um, some vacancies, okay, in the portal there's a service. You can, you, can, uh, you can submit when you want to have your holidays, and you submit that, and you get an approval. Yeah? These are self-services. Okay? Uh, things that you can do by your own. You want to change your banking account? Okay, you do it by your own. There is no employee involved. Okay? So the idea is that in the first step, uh, as much things as possible are somehow automated. Maybe 70% of all the queries, all the questions which come in. If this is not enough, uh, you have call centers. You know, big corporations have call centers. You have a number and you can call. You have, you have a question about your payslip, press 1. You have a question about um, pension, press two. You have a question about health, press three. You have a question about training, press four. Yeah, and then it goes on and if you're lucky, you get a person, <laughs> and you can talk. Okay? And these call centers, where are they located? Where is the person you talk to located? In India, in Ireland. Is that person you are talking to part of the HR department? Not necessarily. Now this person answers a question for an employee at Accenture, and an hour later, he or she is answering a question of, of an employee at BMW. Yeah? They are trained uh, for doing things like this. Okay? We will talk about HR service center in a minute. Okay? Now, if that does not help, you might have an HR expert which you can directly contact or you ultimately talk to an HR business partner to really to, a, to an expert. But these are only the 5%, the 10, 10 to 5% of the queries which come in. These are very special. Okay? And if this does not help, the HR director comes into play. So the idea is really, and I want you to understand, is to, to have a, a very standardized, very efficient process to manage all the queries that come in. And this does not only apply to HR, this does apply to every circumstance where people have questions. Something like this. Okay? So, this is one thing. A very simple idea. Okay? Now, let's talk about shared service center. That's a very important concept. Not only in HR, but also in, in accounting. Wherever you have administrative work, HR or service centers come into play. I'd like to show you this on a very concrete example. Okay? So what you see here is uh, the way how a company did recruiting in earlier days. Okay? So this is a company, and this company has two locations. Let's say one location, unit A, is in Germany, yeah, and the other unit is in UK. And in earlier days, um, both units did the entire recruiting process by their own. So in Germany, they defined the target profile, they did the HR marketing, job posting, and all this stuff, they managed all the incoming applications did a pre-selection, made an assessment, interviews and, so, and such, made job offer negotiation, prepared the job offer, and then introduced the new employee. So this was the entire recruiting process done by the Germans and done in UK, independently. And if somebody like you 
wanted to apply for both locations. You say, okay, I'd like to work in your company. I don't care whether I could work in Germany or in UK. And here is one single application that did not work. You had to apply independently at both units. One application is sent to Germany and one application is sent to UK. And you get different responses. Okay? So, maybe the most important thing on this slide is the line in the middle. <laughs> These are totally different worlds. Right? Is that efficient? Probably not. As you can see here, they work with totally different independent systems, application databases maybe. There's no coordination between these two. No synergy, uh, no potential for synergy effects is used. So if they would do things together, maybe they can be faster, maybe they can be more professional, maybe they can save costs. Yeah? Get rid of one of these systems. Use only one system. Yeah? Have one unit that is taking care for some steps commonly. Okay, that's the idea of shared service center, sharing the same services. Okay. If you apply at SAP, what do you guess? What happens to your application? Where is the person which has a look at your application in the very first step? Where is this person located? In Prague. Doesn't matter whether you apply in Germany or in UK or in the Netherlands or in Italy. Your application from the first step always be reviewed by a person in Prague. Okay. They do all this recruiting stuff for all countries. Okay, that, that's 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 the idea. How does that work? Okay, now we have these different steps in the recruiting process, right? And now we do the following exercise. Okay. Very simple. We ask ourselves, okay, um, there are some steps in a recruiting process which are really standardized. They are always the same. Yeah? Managing incoming applications. Looking, is the application complete? Is the application serious? Or did somebody apply as Barack Obama? Yeah? I mean, all these things happen on a daily basis. Yeah? Um, so there must be somebody who has first look at every incoming application. Um, you, you can't imagine what you get as a recruiter. You get porn and everything. I mean, really, it's, uh, so there must be somebody who has a first look. The first filter is the application complete. Is it serious? Yeah. And and this is always the same. It's always the same task. And it's always the same. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's an application in the Netherlands, in the UK, in Germany, it, uh, France. doesn't matter. It's always the same. It's always the same process. Posting a job ad at Monster. Hey, that's standard. It's always the same. It's an administrative process. It always looks the same. Preparing a job offer contract might be different depending on different legal... Uh, conditions in different countries, but overall, that's more or less the same. I mean, also the pre-selection to a certain extent can be standardized very much. And the other dimension is not only standardization, but 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 how close you want to be to the applicant. Yeah? <coughs> Do you have to talk to the applicant? Do you have to have any kind of conversation with the applicant, or is it something that really happens? really far from the applicant. Okay. So there are also uh, some steps which can't be standardized yeah? and where you really have to be very close to the applicant. You have to talk to the applicant on an individual basis. Yeah? You have to see the applicant. You have to deal with this person. Something like the assessment, assessment center, <coughs> doing interviews giving feedback to the interview, making, making a decision based on the interviews and all these things. 
these can't be standardized. These are very individual. So the idea is when we sort all these different activities, which are all part of the entire recruiting process, we can take all those where you are not close to the applicant and which are very standardized. Take those and move all this, transfer all these activities to a common service center in India, in Ireland, Czech Republic. Okay? If you do this, yeah, then the new world looks like this. Okay? Now, you still have Germany, you still have UK, but in these countries, you only do some of the tasks in a recruiting process. Okay, you still do the definition of the target profile, but then making the job posting on Monster or these typical uh, uh, job boards, managing the application, the incoming application, doing the pre-selection, that is done for both countries in one single shared service or here in that case, shared recruiting center. And then once the, the candidate is pre-selected, uh, the process gets back to the country. They do the interview. They make the negotiation with the candidate. But then the job offer is done by the shared service center. Yeah? And then if the person is hired, the introduction of the new employee, the onboarding, as we used to say, is done in the country. And, and they all, the units... Germany, UK, and the shared service, and they use one single recruiting system in the modern world, an e-recruiting system, uh, which is based on internet technology. Okay? You got this? Yeah? Uh, why do companies do this? Let me ask this question. Why do companies move from such a world to such a world. It's more effective and they don't need that many people. Yeah. The costs. And it's, it's just easier to manage from one to another and if there is no double work. There's no double work. Yeah, you're more effective. You need less people. Yeah, all these things. Yeah, what else? You can also move uh, easy to do operations through low cost. You can save costs because you move actions, activities, tasks to a low-cost country. Right? You can save costs through this. Right? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, again, that also applies in accounting. Yeah? Uh, a company gets an invoice. The invoice is always transferred in the first step to a shared service center. And they look at the invoice. Is it, is it, is it complete? Does it fit to the formal requirements? Yeah. And then it goes to the uh, local units. Okay. It's always the same idea. So let me summarize. Um, there is uh, one model. It's a three-pillar model of modern human resource management organizations. The Drei-Säulen-Modell. Yeah. You really should know this. If you work in HR, you will hear this term all the time, three Säulen model, three pillar model of, of modern HR organizations. So let, let me explain this or just summarize this stepwise. It's a summary. Now, nothing new. I just want to show you an overview how HR business partner, shared service center, technology, how all these things are integrated to serve the customers. Who are the customers of HR? Managers, employees, and to a certain extent also applicants. These are the customers of HR. Yeah. To put it simply, I mean, some would say, no, that's not fully correct, but let's take it that way, okay? Now, the managers, they are supported by the HR business partners. Yeah? You remember, these are those people who really support the managers, the unit, on all HR-related topics. Example? There is a unit, 1,000 employees, and they run through a reorganization. Yeah? Then you deal with change management. Yeah? Or... 
uh, there is a major strategic shift in a unit and you need to qualify the people. You as an HR business partner, you make sure that all these things happen. Yeah? Really manage the strategic topics which are people related. Yeah? Okay? So, uh, we have seen this job ad about HR business partner that gives you a very good indication of what these guys really do. Yeah. Um, now, if an HR business partner um, does not have the expertise for some things, like, I'll give you an example. Um, there, is, there is a unit, okay? There is a unit, and I'm the HR business partner, and this unit has to lay off 20% of its people. You are, you as an HR business partner, you take care for this, yeah? You have to lay off 20% of the people. Now, that's also a legal aspect, okay? Now, an H as an HR business partner, you don't have the understanding, the full understanding about law to do this thing right. So you have to have an expert. Yeah? And these experts are the so-called uh, experts in center of expertise. Yeah? Center of expertise are teams with, uh, with experts. You have experts on labor law. You have experts on executive search. You have experts on employer branding. You have experts on compensation benefits. They are really deep in something. Yeah? That might be a very interesting job for you if you are interested in HR. If you say, I, lo I love HR. I would like to work in HR, but, but not the full range. What I love in HR is talent management or I, I love employer branding, that's really great. You better work in the center of expertise yeah? and you, then you deal with very specific topics yeah? and you go very deep into this and you support the HR business partners, those which directly deal with the customers. The center of expertise, they never deal directly with managers. They support the HR business partners. Okay. Now, what's with the employees? They use IT, SSN, hotline, employee self-services, manager self-services, but employee self-service is most important, and the shared service center, as I've shown you. So, when you talk about the three pillar, when you talk about the three soylent, then what are these? HR business partner, center of expertise, shared service center. In modern organizations, you always find these three roles. Okay. Now, if you are interested in HR, uh, it's a total difference whether you work in a shared service center. You probably will not do this <laughs> because you only do highly standardized administrative stuff. Yeah. Um, but maybe you work in, as an HR business partner. There you learn a lot because you learn the whole range of HR, really. It's a fantastic job. Or you become an expert in something in, within HR, and you might work in a center of expertise. Centers of expertise are, in most cases, located in the headquarter. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, to add one thing, we have a fourth role sometimes. Uh, and the fourth role is you, you work with partners, suppliers. Yeah, you outsource something. So, uh, Beyond the HR business partner, center of expertise, and the shared service center, you might also have external partners you work with, agencies, executive search companies, uh, companies that take care for, for payroll, uh, things like this. Okay. Now, is that clear? Or are there any questions around this? And you... As a preparation for the exam, I mean, really think about why must this be this way? Why is that such a smart model? Yeah. Why do companies do this? Yeah. Uh, I want you to see the reasons behind it. Yeah. To summarize this again, and, um, these people directly support the managers. They have a very broad understanding. Yeah. By the experts, they have a very deep understanding. You have to have both. 
You can't be a generalist in everything and the expert in everything. You can't be that. So you need both. And this combination helps organization to deal with, with, all, relate, with all relevant topics and with the required expertise. And all these things here, the Shared Service Center, are there to really manage all the admin stuff in a very efficient, professional way. Okay? So with that, such a model, you cover all the different roles which are required in HR. Okay? Now let's talk a little bit about outsourcing. You, 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 you know this term outsourcing, right? Outsourcing? Yeah, there's a question. Very good question. As an applicant, how can you tell whether there is a decentralized organization or a centralized organization? They will tell you when you apply. They will either tell you apply there or apply here. Either you see it on the web. Yeah, you find different online forms. Yeah, different parts of the career website. One is maybe UK, the other is Germany. They, they look different. They have different application modes or as you said they will tell you yeah if you if you ask okay i want to apply it both in uk and in german they will tell you okay you have to send two applications you you will learn this okay okay outsourcing what is that dumb question what is the difference between outsourcing and offshoring. Well, I guess you can outsource without offshoring something. You can outsourcing is if you just give it to another business that service to you. You give some services, some activities, some tasks to an external provider, which is not part of your organization. Okay? Outsource. You let somebody else do the job. Okay. So once you have outsourced something, it's no more a task that is done by your organization. It's done by somebody else outside the organization. It's outsourcing. What is offshoring? Have you heard this term? You manage it yourself, but you do it in a lower cost. You do it by yourself, but you do it. You, you, you do it maybe in a low-cost country or somewhere else in the world. Right? Um, there, there are ways to to structure all these things. Yeah, uh, I don't want to go too deep into this, but uh, but uh, just want you to see that there is a difference between outsourcing, where you really transfer activities to an external partner. And offshoring, you do it by your own in your organization, maybe in a shared service center, but the shared service center is an island in India or somewhere else. That's offshoring. Okay? Now, the important question, and I want you to see this. That's, that's, that's the most important part here. Um, first, which tasks can be outsourced? And the second question, which I want you to understand, is why do companies do this? Yeah? Um, now, here is a, a way how companies can really prioritize different tasks and then make a decision upon which tasks can be outsourced and which not. Yeah? It depends on our strategy and our core competence. Okay, it depends on our core competence. What is that, a core competence? <coughs> May I ask you this question? <laughs> What is that? Core competence. Uh, the, the thing we really rely on to be uh, distinguished in the market. Something where you're really strong. Uh, uh, basis where you can distinguish it from the market, from the competitor. The core competence. Something where you're really strong. Is payroll, is recruiting part of your core competence? Could be, at least for recruiting, but for payroll, I mean, look at a company like Microsoft, look at a company like Google, look at a company like, like Daimler. Is, is doing payroll 
is that a core competence of these, these, these co corporations? <coughs> Probably not. Their core competence is developing, producing, and selling cars. So the question is, what is our competence? Where are we strong and where are we weak? Uh, when Bill Gates was asked, Bill Gates, in earlier days, when Bill Gates was asked, what is the biggest strength of Microsoft? What is the biggest strength of Microsoft? You know what he said? He said, the biggest strength of Microsoft is recruiting the m smartest and brilliant people. That's what he said. Yeah, that's our biggest strength, recruiting the best. It's interesting. It was not that he said, our biggest strength is uh, producing the best software. <laughs> yeah. So he really said, that's one of our biggest strengths. We are very strong in this, and we will, we will do this by our own. And it's a task of our managers and of the executives to make sure that the best people in the world work at Microsoft. They had this philosophy. Okay? While other companies might say, our biggest strength is building cars, but hiring people, we are really weak in this, and, and that's fine. Let somebody else do the job. Okay? So the question is really, where are we strong and where are we weak? Uh, in those tasks where we feel we are weak, you can think about whether somebody else should do the job. Yeah? So this is the internal competence compared to the external service provider. Um, and then, how specific are the requirements for these different tasks? How specific? I mean, things like employer branding, they are really, they are really specific. They differ from company to company, really. Performance management, that's so specific. Yeah? You hardly can standardize this. Um, uh, top management placements, hmm. yeah. Um, highly specific to a certain extent, yeah. But things like pension, MS office trainings. I mean, this is not specific. You do the same. External providers can do the same MS office training in totally different corporations. That's always the same. It's not specific. Yeah. Uh, the same as this payroll. Yeah. Uh, exit interviews. Once somebody has quit the job doing an exit interview, asking the person, why did you leave? Why did you decide to leave this company? Do you have specific requirements on doing something like this? Probably not. Yeah. Is it a, a strength of a company to do something like this? Probably not. So all these things on the, uh, on the bottom left-hand side could be outsourced. Okay? So that's a very typical idea. Especially if you have tasks with a high volume, yeah? tasks that you do on very often, yeah? uh, then you also can outsource this. Uh, you would not outsource something if it has a high strategic relevance. If something's really strategic, something like top management placement, I mean deciding who going to be our next CEO, CFO. That's strategic. You might take some help from external partners, but that's, that's somewhere in the middle, right? Okay? So that's a very good task to sort these different tasks and to, to, to find out which things might be, can be outsourced and which not. The next question is, why do companies outsource? And again, this does not apply only to HR. It also applies to, to uh, accounting, uh, uh, other areas, parts of purchase. Yeah. Um, wow. Here's the answer. Yeah. And let's talk about these points for some minutes. One point we also already talked about, it's focus. And that's clear. Yeah. Focus. I'm Daimler. My strength is building cars, producing cars. My strength is not running a payroll organization. So I would like to focus on 
on, on the ultimate purpose of our company, which is producing cars. So let's get rid of all the rest. Yeah? If you get rid of all the rest, you can focus on your ultimate purpose. That's, that's one idea. I mean, that's, that's quite simple. Let's talk about the second point. As some would say, once you have outsourced a task, you get higher quality. Yeah? If I let an external partner do all the payroll, Gehaltsabrechnung, I get better quality. Why? We assume that we produce uh, cell phones and found a company which we have read about the production plans that some companies they, they focus on the application. So I believe that this company would make really good application for the thing on the so Why? But why? Because mm. they're focused only on this yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So what you said is if you work with an external partner, probably this external partner is doing nothing else than this. Right? Uh, they do nothing else than payroll. They do nothing else than recruiting. They do nothing else than Microsoft Office training. So they must be strong on this and they are stronger than we are. Okay? So let's do them do the job. That's one point. Another point is, I mentioned this on the slide, this has to do with competition. I give you a very concrete example of your daily life. If you have a question and you visit the examination office, Prüfungsamt, Studentenbüro, Students' Office, International Center. Yeah? Now imagine you are totally pissed. I don't get the right answer in time. I don't get any response. And the response is bad. <laughs> What can you do? Huh? What can you do? Drink wine. Drink wine, right. You can drink. <laughs> Seriously, what can you do? Nothing. There is only this one student's office. You have no choice. They are in a monopolist position. Okay? And if I find myself in a monopolist position, if I know I'm the only one, you can only ask me. Yeah? I must not care about my job because, I mean, there is no competition, right? Would be maybe a good idea to have two students office and they get paid for every request of a student. For every request they get five euro. That would change the world. These two students office and you can choose between the one or the other. And they earn money whenever you visit them. Yeah? you would immediately feel that now they, they compete and they will do their best to get the most requests. Yeah? And they do the best that you come again to this office and not to this office. So once you have a competition, the different offices will do their best. And that's, that's one issue with HR. I tell you, honestly. That's an issue with HR. If you work in a corporation and you have a question about whatever, company car, payslip, vacation, pension, training. You don't have a choice. You have only this HR department. So, since they are not competing against another HR department, they are allowed to do a lousy job, to put it that way. I don't say that they do this. Yeah? Okay. But if they do a lousy job, it probably does not matter uh, in a way, how it would matter to an external partner. So external partners, external service providers, they compete against each other and they try to do the best yeah, to, to compete. Now, how about costs? Yeah? We say through outsourcing we can save costs. And the answer is written on the slide. Economy of scale. What is that? Yeah? Economics first session. <laughs> more together, you can do it more efficiently. Right, so. Uh, the cost per payslip. What is the cost of producing one single Gehaltsabrechnung on a monthly basis? The cost per payslip, if you do 
if you do this 1,000 times a month, you produce 1,000 payslips a month, uh, the cost per payslip is probably higher than when you do 10,000 a month. Okay? Like if you produce 100 pretzels a day, cost per pretzel is higher than when you produce 1,000 pretzels a day. Why? Hmm? Come on. Economics. Why is this the case? <sighs> yeah. You used your capacity. Yeah. Okay. What else? Capacity. What? What is that capacity? Machines. Yeah. Systems. Yeah. Okay. The chance to learn. Yeah. All this stuff. What else? Why economy scale? Why does it work? That's a fundamental idea of business. If you do more, it usually pays off to invest heavily into technology and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. And then you can do it more efficiently. If I do 200 pay slips a month, do I consider investing in a huge, sophisticated software? Probably not. But if I do 10,000 times a month, yes, I would do this and then it pays off. Right. Okay, flexibility. I mean, that's easy. Think about a recruiting department. Um, what do you do with your recruiters in times where you don't hire? Huh? Fire them. <laughs> don't do this. Right? Yeah, but if you if you if you if you if you outsource some services, you just take the services when you need them, and if you don't need them in times where you don't hire. It's fine, no problem. Okay. So these are the four things which I want you to understand. Yeah? Focus, quality, costs, flexibility. Yeah? Again, this is nothing to learn by heart, but something which you need to be able to explain. Maybe with an own example. That would be fine. Okay. Okay. So, HR organization, these were all these different things we talked about yeah? quite a lot. Global integration, local differentiation, global HR, up to a three-pillar model of modern organization, outsourcing, onshoring, offshoring, target role, and so on.